Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 9. We want to read a little bit there. Thank you for coming out tonight. And uh, I know that it gets dark really early and uh, we can make a lot of excuses. But I'm glad I have a desire to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I have a desire to sing his praises. Have a desire to read his word. Have a desire for an old-fashioned Holy Ghost filled revival. Anybody like to see an old time Holy Ghost sin killing revival? Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, if you have your place in the book of Acts chapter 9, give me a big healthy hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's begin reading at verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogue that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And I want to stop right there tonight. Um, I've heard people say, uh, for the love of God, what are you doing? And they say it sort of like a byword. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For the love of God, what are you doing? But being on the serious side, I'd like to just turn that around. Mm. What are you doing for the love of God? Oh. You know, I, as the Lord began to bring this to my mind early in the morning, that's a time when we can have communication without too much interruption. And uh, immediately I begin to think of the Apostle Paul. Now, he was short in stature. According to the way history records him, he wasn't uh, someone that people would have looked up to. But he had a zeal. I would that somebody get a zeal. Amen. You know, you hear, you hear it said about some people, there's not a lazy bone in their body. <laughs> and then about others, every bone in their body is lazy. But I don't think there was a lazy bone in, in Saul's body. He wanted to excel. Maybe one of the reasons that he had such a zeal was because he was short in statue and he had infirmities in the flesh. And, uh, but he had this zeal. And so he, he, was, he grew up in the house of a Pharisee. 
And he had a religious zeal. He wanted to do something for God. Right. He really did. He had that zeal. He wanted to do something for God, he thought. And sometimes we get our thoughts mixed up. And I actually believe that Saul was somewhat honest in his zeal. Because he had studied the law of Moses under one of the greatest re renowned teachers of that day, Gamaliel. And he had excelled in learning from that man above his equals. And so he did gain respect. He was still a little short guy, but he still had statue in respect because he sought after the knowledge of the law. And so among the Pharisees, he was considered one to be respected. And he enjoyed that. And he was so zealous that it wasn't just enough to be knowledgeable in the law. He wanted to be an enforcer of the law. That's right. You know, that kind of fit his ego. He had those that he could command to do those things that he wasn't large enough to do. He wasn't a big man. He wasn't big enough to kill the giant by himself, but he had gained enough respect to have others to do those things for him. And he had gained respect among the Sanhedrin, the high priest, to the point that they would just give him letters of authority to do pretty much whatever he wanted to. And of course, those that crucified Jesus hated Christians anyway, so they were giving him authority. And he had made havoc of the church in Jerusalem, persecuting the church. And many were scattered and moved away. The apostles were left. In Jerusalem, they wouldn't move. They wouldn't go. Some of them died, but they wouldn't move. But others that were disciples began to be dispersed across the land. And as they went, they went preaching the gospel. And so the gospel began to be heard. You know, I don't know what it takes for us to get zealous about the things of God, but we need to be. And Saul was... He had a hate for Christians. Yeah. He will put them in prison. They're not abiding by the law of Moses. You know why? They found liberty. Amen. <laughs> Glory. They could, he couldn't understand that. Why aren't they abiding by the law of Moses? Why aren't they listening to the teaching of the Pharisees? Why aren't they listening to me? I'm great in knowledge and they ought to hear me. You know? And so he was persecuting the church. And so he got letters to go to Damascus because they'd spread out over there and there was Christians over there in that area now. He's going to go over there and put a stop to that. He's going to go over there and arrest them. Bring them back to Jerusalem. Beat them. Maybe even kill them like he did Stephen. He was the one consenting to Stephen's death and held the clothes or the coats or cloaks of those that stoned Stephen to death. But on his way over there, something happened. A light from heaven shined around him. I would that the light would shine into somebody's life. Amen. And he fell to the ground trembling and astonished. Yeah, he thought he had the power. 
But all of a sudden, he's encountered a power that he cannot do anything with. That's right, amen. A power that is greater than him. And so, he says, who art thou, Lord? Wow. All of a sudden, he's the big man. But now he has humbled himself and says, who art thou, Lord? What would you have me to do? And Jesus, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. Go into the city and it'll be told you what you shall do. Something happened that day. He didn't lose his zeal. He did lose his authority with the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Actually, he didn't just lose it, he gave it up. That's right. Actually, he said, I counted all of those things that I gained but lost for Christ. He gave it all away that he might know this power that he encountered on the road to Damascus. Now, he didn't lose his zeal. He just changed his operations. Right. Something just happened in his life. Now, all this time, he thought he was doing something for the love of God. But a part of it was for the love of Saul. He liked. He liked being looked up to. He liked having authority. Yes. He enjoyed being in charge. And so he really wasn't doing it for God after all. Though in the back of his mind he thought he was. I wonder how many times we get confused. But I really want this. But if we stop and think about it, are we wanting it for the glory of God or for the glory of self? Saul had an awakening on the Damascus Road. Mm -hmm. And he said, all things that I had come and gained, I count but loss for Christ. He fell in love with Jesus. That's right, amen. And he began to preach Jesus being the Son of God. He began to really want to do things for the love of God. You see... Kevin on the Gators. What's his name? Kevin Williams. He sings a song. And it tells the story of a group of singers that are going out and singing for the Lord. Singing for the Lord. And they travel and they sing and they travel and they sing and then they get a bus and then they get a bigger bus and then they get a bigger bus and by the end of time of the song is ended they're just singing for the bus you know and if we're not careful that's what we do that's right we get our eyes on the wrong thing amen that's we right. get to looking at oh how great we are and how much this person liked what we did but what we ought to be considered are we doing it for the love of god Man. For the love of God, what are you doing? Lord, help us. You know, sometimes we can do this because, boy, it really feels good to say. But Saul 
which means destroyer, met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and his name was changed to Paul, which meant worker. So he still had his zeal, but this time he had a zeal according to knowledge. He talked about the children of Israel. He talked about those that had been in his religion. He said, I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. We need to wake up. Amen. Need to take inventory and need to say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Yeah. It's real easy. It's real easy when people pat you on the back. Well, that was really good. I really enjoyed that. That was really a good job tonight. That makes it real easy. And I, don't get me wrong, I think we should encourage one another, so don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying tonight. But if we start doing it for that reason, that's when we get in trouble. That's right, amen. It's a little harder when somebody says, well, I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm talking about, I've been there. I didn't like that. I don't agree with you. It makes it a little harder. Well, as long as I'm doing it better, you do it. Well, that's probably true, but I just do what I can do. And I want to do what I do for him. Amen. It may not be as good as somebody else. In your eyes. And probably won't even be as good as somebody else in my eyes. But if I keep my focus on doing it because I love him, it'll be good in his eyes. Amen. And that's what really matters. What are you doing for the love of God? It's real easy for a pastor, and thank God for all of you for being so good to us. It makes it easy for a pastor when he's being supported well. But there is something that gives him strength if he seeks God continually in the down times when he's having to sacrifice, when he's having to cry out, I don't know what to do, Lord. I'm just here for you. There's something special about that to know that you're just doing it for him. Yes. Just doing it for him. And Irene and I have been in those places where we did sacrifice. There was no other reason for us to do what we were doing but because we love the Lord. After I joined this organization, there was a person that every time I was in their presence, they would make this kind of remark. Ain't no reason for a preacher to join an organization except for the money. If they had only known. That's right, amen. If they had only known. And finally I said, 
if I was doing it for the money, I'd never, ever again stand in the pulpit and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ because I could get more money doing something else. Now, don't get me wrong, I enjoy it when I don't have to struggle so hard. But I ask the Lord to search me day by day, even in the good times, and help me to keep my focus on doing what I do for the right reason. Bless the Lord. Because I love Him. And I ask him time after time after time, Lord, help me to love you more than anything. You know, if you, if you see people that say they're doing what they do for the Lord and the money stops and they stop, that ought to tell you something. That's right. Now, I know you can't do as much without money, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But a person that will throw up their hands and quit and not try to do anything because that somebody is not supporting them greatly, something wrong with the picture. That's right, amen. Something wrong with the picture. But Saul, he was changed to Paul and and in his transformation, he still had his zeal. He still didn't have a lazy bone in his body. But he became a worker that God could use. Amen. Wrote more than half of the New Testament. And when he was shipwrecked at sea, he was still there for the glory of God. That's right. Amen. And when they were trying to kill him and others let him down in the wall so that he could escape and keep on preaching, he was doing it still yet for the glory of God. And he continued to do what he did because he loved God. And he loved God so much that he said, whenever he was getting ready to go to the chop block, the time of my departure is at hand. Just sort of like it ain't no big deal. Huh? Because he's doing it for the love of God. Amen. The time of my departure is at hand. I have kept the faith. I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, I did what I did for the love of God. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. For the love of God, what are you doing? You know, people use that when they think somebody's doing something they shouldn't be doing, and they use it more or less as a byword and not really as serious as it ought to be. That's right. But we ought to ask ourselves, what are we doing? Because we love God. Just for no other reason but to love God. Loving God, loving each other. Amen. Loving God, loving each other. Yeah. What are we doing for the love? just in some way to make a statement to say we sing the song oh how I love Jesus <laughs> I've heard this saying over and over in my lifetime and I have come to believe that it is true actions Speak louder than words. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
what are you doing? Just because you love God. Not to gain any personal recognition. Not to be compensated in this life. Don't misunderstand me. God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. You do have a reward coming. Amen. And I'm glad that most of mine's on beyond her. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have longer to enjoy it over there. I'm glad that most of mine's over yonder <laughs> on the other side. What are you doing for the love of God? What are you doing for the love of God? Is it for him? It's a good question we should ask in practically everything we do. Does this show the love of God? Does it show God I'm loving him? Does it show the love of God in me for others? What am I doing for the love of God? I have uh, shared my heart with you tonight.